compass spirit. Nor can memory truly be frozen in the shrines that men erect. But in granite and marble, in fieldstone and clay and bronze, we symbolize our desire to preserve what is enduringly valuable in our lives and in our honored history, to remind ourselves of what men have been willing to do and be and give for liberty. The American soldier is so honored and always has been. In this tomb at Arlington lie the bodies of the unknowns of World War I. World War II and Korea. Symbols of all the heroes who fell in the wars of the nation's maturity. Their memory and the memory of all their brothers in arms before them are enshrined in a chain of tribute which stretches back across the developing story of the United States. Back to the beginning of the nation. and of the army which has fought to preserve it. These were the first, the embattled farmers, as the poet Emerson called them. At Concord Bridge, they fired the shot heard round the world. They began their adventure as a group of individuals united at first only by something intangible in the emerging American spirit. A sense of the importance of independence. A belief that a man should have something to say about his own affairs. The Continental Congress gave their struggle a direction that was breathtaking in its audacity and sweeping in its vision of man's rights. Not mere rebellion the creation of a new and uniquely free nation. Destiny provided a leader to match the peril and need of the time, and under him, through eight years haunted with incredible hardship, were shaped the victories of Trenton and Saratoga, and finally, of Yorktown. The dream of American liberty at last took life. A constitutional bedrock of political morality and religious freedom gave this dream a base, an anchor for the soaring aspirations of generations to come. The acquisition of vast new lands through the Louisiana Purchase provided room for a period of vigorous growth. The people used the peaceful years to settle new territories. But before the nation was 30 years old, war came again. The War of 1812. In this conflict with the British, the central issue was the rights of American seamen, and the war was primarily a naval one. The Battle of New Orleans was the only important action by ground forces in this war, and it was actually fought after the war was officially over. Here, the Army learned more about military tactics. The nation learned something about its need for a professional army to stand ready against attack. And the attacking forces learned the folly of underestimating the stubborn resourcefulness of men defending their freedom. Now there followed nearly half a century of expansion as the nation's frontier was pushed ever farther and farther westward. In retrospect, the simple confidence of those pioneers in the face of the hardships, uncertainties, and dangers which lay before them is amazing. And their achievement, a lasting and inspiring heritage. Americans 
Alliance had begun the work of making a continental United States a reality. Now Texas wrote a preface to the next chapter in America's history. And a mission compound whose name might otherwise have become merely an obscure historical footnote became a synonym for endurance and heroism. This was the Alamo. Texas won its independence after a long and bloody struggle, during which a band of 187 Americans met death and won enduring fame at the Alamo. The frontiers expanded and the flow of the nation's commerce grew. The midpoint of the 19th century was reached and passed in peace. But as the late 1850s approached, a storm of violent opinion was building, which would threaten the very unity of the nation. The most tragic of all wars, that of brother against brother, was forced upon the nation. Soldiers of both sides went into battle secure in the belief in their cause. The Confederate soldier had behind him the unified effort of a culture that was actually a way of life. He also had a superb military organization. Perhaps more than these, he had a hot, defiant pride, a formidable confidence that he would win. He fought with a magnificence that did him high credit. And in the end, it was not his spirit or skill, but his resources that failed him. The Union Army suffered at first from overconfidence and a lack of unity. But in the refining fire of combat, these were done away. And by mid-war, the Union soldier emerged as one of the most effective fighters in military history. This war was many things. It was the first modern war in terms of weaponry, transport, technology. It was a war of spectacular plans, brilliant in their execution. Its campaigns still provide lessons for students of tactics. In human terms, the war was a national tragedy. Viewed historically, it preserved the nation. Today, a battlefield like Gettysburg becomes a many-acre national shrine where silence and memory command the ground so torn by the fury of shot and shell a century ago. Where living men fought and suffered, bronze and stone now stand, sentinels of a nation's conscience, telling over and over for every succeeding age how dearly bought is the unity which makes this nation one and indivisible. And at Arlington, a memorial to the Civil War dead expresses what might be said of all American soldiers of every war. Not for fame or reward, not for place or rank, not lured by ambition or goaded by necessity, but in simple obedience to duty as they understood it. These men suffered all, sacrificed all, dared all, and died. America's advancement, once again made secure through the courage and sacrifice of her fighting men, stretched into the West and into the future with limitless promise. Two great oceans were to be linked. The continent was to become one great nation in geographical as well as philosophical fact. The great reach westward was met by the west reaching eastward. All this did not, however, go unopposed. The Indian, who had resisted the settlement of the new continent from the beginning, had grown bold and powerful while the nation was absorbed in its struggles for the Union.
to the soldier fell the task of bringing safety to the Great West. It was a harsh assignment. The Army's Western forces totaled only some 10,000 men scattered widely across the vast plains. This 10,000 faced an enemy which numbered 250,000. He did more than his duty, wrote one army general of this soldier of the West. He did more than his duty. And in the doing, he wrote a page of history which will be read and thrilled to so long as men prize courage. Still, much of the time, as always, the soldier's duty was carried out unheralded, in tedium, hardship and isolation, unrelieved by the excitement of combat action. Under vast skies, he did a vast job. By the end of the 19th century, the West and the internal security of the entire country were stabilized. Ocean to ocean, the American nation stretched, strong and free. But just beyond the nation's borders, new fires were kindling. In the summer of 1898, the USS Maine was blown up in Havana Harbor. Now the American soldier fought to help Cuba gain her independence from Spain. And again, he prevailed. The beginning of the new century brought rumblings of a much greater challenge and much farther from our shores. America hoped to remain uninvolved, but that was not to be. The doughboy went into his first European combat experience full of confidence and idealism. He was determined to save the world for democracy. It was an agonizing war of stalemate and negligible gains of ground bitterly fought for. A war of trenches and barbed wire cutting across the heart of France. New weapons brought to the battlefield a deadliness never known before. He fought well through the holocaust of Cantigny, Chateau Thierry, Mellow Wood, the Marne, the Argonne Forest. Steadily, stubbornly, he made his way across the torn and bloody ground. He turned the tide of battle. The price he willingly paid won him victory and an immortal place in the memory of generations of soldiers yet to come. Now came years of burgeoning industrial power, of swift development spurred at first by the belief that the war just ended had in fact ended all war. Within two decades, however, this industrial might would be desperately needed. By the late 1930s, America could not mistake the shape of things to come. Knowing time might be short, the nation began to mobilize. Around a small nucleus of trained professionals, a mighty fighting force had to be built. A force that would use combat skills that were new and untried in battle so far as American troops were concerned. 
The enemy had shown the effectiveness of such modern skills all too clearly in Europe. By December of 1941, all time for preparation had run out. With what there was left, of what she had ready, America fought back. For some, whose stubborn resistance had bought priceless time for their country, the months ahead, in captivity, would sorely test their fortitude, their moral stamina, and their faith in the ultimate victory of their free nation. History would record that they had that fortitude, that stamina and faith, and that their faith was justified. History would record, too, how their comrades in arms devised and put into practice techniques of assault that had not been in the book until the necessities of a global purpose called forth the needed answers. amphibious assault, first perfected in the Pacific and in Italy, would be put to use later in the greatest landing ever attempted in the history of man. D-Day, the 6th of June, 1944. which had been set for them came perilously close to being impossible. Somehow, they accomplished it. They established a massive beachhead and turned their faces and their weapons inward upon the enemy's heartland. Sometimes slowly, foot by foot. Sometimes swiftly, mile on mile, they pressed forward. With the total force of America's now hugely expanded productive capacity behind them. Finally, it became manifest that nothing was going to stop them. There came a time at last when the inevitability of the war's outcome became clear, even to the determined and resourceful enemy. America's industrial might, her capacity for production, were still growing. The enemy's was growing less with every passing day. Now the long and bitter time of fighting in Europe was over, and all attention turned to the Pacific. 
Intensified effort from the air reflected our wish to avoid the cruelly costly prospect of a land invasion of Japan. began the morning a single bomber, instead of the usual hundreds, delivered an ultimatum. On board the battleship Missouri, General Douglas MacArthur accepted the surrender. World War II was at an end. Hundreds of thousands came home. A great many others did not. And on far beaches lay rusting reminders of flame and bitter violence. Time and the sea would erase them, but the nation's debt to the men who brought them there would remain. The growing complexity of warfare brought changes in the Army. The variety of skills and specialties needed to support its overall mission grew, and its men kept pace with this dramatic growth. The days when a soldier needed only to keep his eyes and ears open, his mouth shut, and his rifle clean were long and permanently gone. Nevertheless, the prime mission of the soldier, to be ready to deliver swift and effective force against any threat to his nation's security, remained, and his readiness to meet any new challenge was kept sharp. In June of 1950, from among the beautiful peaks and valleys of Korea, the new challenge came, and the response was unequivocal. At the start, there were not enough of them, a familiar situation. But they used what they had to good effect. They kept victory beyond the grasp of the aggressors while reinforcements rallied. In the United States, the citizen, as always, came through. By the tens of thousands, he shouldered the responsibility for doing his part in maintaining the freedom he'd been born into. He did himself and the nation proud service when the need arose. He learned what he had to learn. He mastered the bewildering swiftness of the change from civilian to soldier. He gained the pride that comes to a group of individuals when, through hard work, they become an effective, smoothly coordinated team. In Korea, after a year of swift seesaw movement, the fighting settled into a stalemate. Constant patrolling, endless fighting over the same bits of battered earth. These taxed the soldier's endurance. Still, he kept at his job to convince the enemy that he could not win. In the end, he made his point that armed aggression against free men would be met and thwarted wherever and whenever it might appear. By the late 1950s, the soldiers' training was more widely varied than ever before in history. He learned to be at home in the steaming jungle. He mastered the equipment, the tactics, the specialized techniques required for combat in the Arctic snow. He swallowed the dust and endured the heat of desert operations where the temperature was 115 in the shade. 
and there was no shame. He worked with weapons which were ever more powerful, more complex, more varied and effective. His firepower had become impressive indeed. Today, there are new challenges to be faced. Since the time of the Minutemen at Concord Bridge, much has changed. The tools, the technology, the mobility and firepower wielded by the soldier of today would seem fantastic to men who went into battle armed only with flintlocks and a stubborn dream. Much has changed, but much remains the same. Flintlocks have become museum pieces but the dream of the men who bore them still animates their counterparts in the 20th century. The times have changed. The determination of free men to remain free has not. Today, as in the beginning, the high intent of a nation depends for its chance of fulfillment upon the man who is ready to give whatever may be needed, the soldier. He is worthy, today as then, of the grateful tribute of his people, because he is, today as then, ready. Ready to redeem, in full measure, the pledge which echoes and re-echoes throughout the soldier's heritage. For freedom, our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. <laughs>